All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining Map Rounds today. Um, um, it is an honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Hamwi O, and who is an assistant professor in the departments of psychiatry and human behavior and cognitive and linguistic and psychological sciences at Brown mm -hmm. University. Uh, she also serves as a, as a director of the Imaging Research in the Memory and Aging Program at Butler Hospital, which is affiliated with Brown. Um, she received her PhD in biopsychology at the State University of New York at Stony Brook and did her postdoctoral training in Dr. William Jagust's um, laboratory at Berkeley, where she studied cognitive structural and functional alterations in preclinical older adults with um, amyloid beta deposition using PET, um, structural MRI, functional MRI, and neuropsychological tests. And before uh, starting in Brown, she was an assistant professor at the top Institute for Research on Alzheimer's Disease and the Aging Brain at Columbia University and a research assistant professor at Sunny Stony Brook. At Brown, she and her lab study cognitive and neural changes due to normal aging and Alzheimer's disease pathologies and individual difference factors that contribute to the risk and resilience to brain aging and Alzheimer's disease using multimodality neuroimaging methods that include PET and structural and functional MRI. Again, it is such a pleasure uh, to have you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And just to remind everyone, please add your questions to the Q&A um, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. All right. Thank you for a uh, kind introduction and thank you so much for inviting me to uh, map rounds. Um, I, the map rounds has been a terrific uh, resource for um, the educational resources as well as um, the connecting the researchers across the board in the autonomous community. So I'm very happy to be part of uh, your uh, incredible effort. Um, the topic that I'm going to talk about today is to translate quantum neuroscience into a preclinical realm of autoimmune disease. Uh, as a full disclosure, I am not a clinician. Uh, I was trained as a quantum neuroscientist uh, studying um, the neural substrates of uh, human memory function using um, functional MRI for my graduate study and uh, did postdoctoral research on aging and autoimmune disease. Uh, and during that time, I applied additional human neuroimaging method of uh, functional imaging tomography and structural MRI. Uh, so in this talk, I will start with a brief overview of uh, autism disease and preclinical autism disease as a, a background, uh, as a research concept, uh, and as a background for this talk. And next, I will talk about the studies that examine the impact of autism disease pathologies on cognition and structural measures in preclinical autism disease using um, traditional neuropsychological approaches. Then I will talk about uh, some of my work that use the quantum neuroscience approaches studying um, and the uh, brain function, uh, differences in brain function in association with a beta pathology. Then I will discuss how we can use them to further help early detection and intervention of a preclinical autism disease and what are the remaining questions to be solved. And last, I will talk about individual differences and their influence on cognition and neural measures in preclinical autism disease. So autism disease is known to be a clinic uh, called pathologic entity. Uh, so if an individual's cognitive and functional assessment results uh, fall under the dementia range, uh, such as MMSC score of 21, along with the severe hippocampal and cortical atrophic patterns on, um, seen on structural MRI scans that are commonly used to assist the diagnostic uh, process. Uh, then the individual, uh, and along with the uh, medical exams and uh, family history, the individual is diagnosed as autism disease uh, with dementia. If the pathological data become available either by autopsy or amyloid PET scans uh, or uh, elevated plasma measures that are currently available uh, showing the presence of elevated uh, autoimmune disease pathologies such as beta amyloid plaques and tau neurofibrillary tangles, the diagnosis is confirmed as autoimmune disease. On the other hand, when cognitive and functional assessment results fall under the normal range, such as MMSC score of 29 in a 75-year-old person, 
um, the person is considered as country normal and um, normal size of hippocampus and ventricles are expected to be seen through a visual inspection of an MRI scan and uh, probably uh, no beta amyloid uh, accumulation in amyloid PET scans. However, um, if uh, it has been long known that the beta amyloid plaques are shown in clinically intact older adults uh, through autopsy studies, and it has become more obvious with the advent of uh, amyloid PET scan method. Because AD pathologies uh, were traditionally considered as a causal factor of autism disease symptoms, this discrepancy between the presence of AD pathologies and absence of uh, clinical symptoms has led to the conceptualization of autism disease as AD clinical versus AD pathophysiological. Um, because AD pathologies have been traditionally linked to clinical symptoms of uh, autism disease, currently normal appearing with the presence of AD pathologies on uh, these explanations. Uh, one possible explanation that has uh, received much attention is a brain reserve hypothesis, which was followed by other related terminologies and conceptualizations that collectively fall under the resistance and resilience framework, nicely summarized by Arena Orquizo and Vemory. Another possibility is that AD pathologies, especially beta amyloid plaques, uh, are not direct causes of autism disease symptoms. The other possibility is that cognitive and neural changes associated with autism disease pathologies may have not uh, fully captured yet by the currently available measurements and models. So the first two possibilities are quite well depicted in the hypothetical model of a pathophysiological processes of, of autism disease. Um, this model shows temporal sequences of multiple physiological processes, uh, including autism disease pathological markers, neural injury, and clinical events that become abnormal over time as the disease progresses. Although the causal relationship between these biomarkers still remains to be established, the model signifies the temporal gap between the development of brain beta amyloid plaques and the appearance of noticeable clinical symptoms. And this hypothetical model has been continuously revised since the 2010 model to incorporate new findings and the most uh, recent version of the diagram that is up here on this uh, slide highlight a couple of important observations. One is that below the detection threshold, abnormality of top pathology precedes uh, amyloid pathology. And another uh, point is that with the same amount of pathology, the onset of clinical symptoms varies across individuals, uh, such that individuals with a higher risk due to lifestyle comorbidity or genetic components are behaviorally impaired earlier than individuals with a lower risk. Individuals with normal cognition but abnormal amyloid pathology are now considered as preclinical autism disease according to the new criteria uh, developed uh, by NIA and Autism Association. Although it is important to know that uh, it is a research concept at this point. A data-driven model uh, that has been developed using ADNI data set provides additional information uh, that uh, was not depicted in the uh, hypothetical model shown on the left. So in this model, uh, the model shows vascular abnormality that precedes, uh, precedes a better deposition um, as well as um, other uh, autism disease uh, pathological markers, such as CSF uh, tau and CSF a, uh, a beta. In addition, the model shows symptoms of memory impairment from very early stage uh, disease stages that even precedes the abnormalities observed uh, in molecular biomarkers such as CSF uh, a beta and CSF uh, p tau, which is contrary uh, to um, but uh, previously, uh, previous observational venous studies proposed. So this suggests that cognitive decline associated with late onset autism disease is not a final product of uh, a large brain changes, but a continuous consequence of subtle pathological alterations in primary disease factors, for example, vascular dysregulation and a uh, amyloid beta effects. And uh, I believe as the fields move forward and more biomarker measures from a large number of study participants uh, became available, uh, these models will continue to revise and inform us new insights into the pathophysiological processes of the disorder. 
Uh, regardless, however, uh, better understanding of a preclinical stage of the disorder in humans uh, is critical uh, to identify the role of AD path uh, pathologies in the disease mechanisms uh, to inform us early sign of the disorder and to better understand the normal brain aging processes. Um, using amyloid PET scans <clears throat> and a quantification method that is typically used in the field, uh, we can now see that uh, AD patients uh, mostly uh, belong to amyloid positive group. And among currently normal older adults who are 60 years old and beyond, approximately 30% show uh, amyloid deposition with PET, which is consistent with autopsy findings. Um, so older adults who are within a normal range of cognition but present with amyloid deposition are considered as preclinical AD. In this analytic review, uh, each circle represents an individual study with the size of the um, circle representing sample size of the study and depicts a proportion of a preclinical autism disease as a function of a mean age of the sample. And as the figure summarizes, preclinical AD starts to be seen uh, around the age of 50 and approximately 50% of older adults fall into uh, this category uh, uh, at the age of 85. Thus, the proportion of preclinical autism disease increases with age in the late adult, uh, adulthood. And despite the fact that uh, the uh, a linear relationship between the amount of beta amyloid plaques and clinical symptoms is lacking, um, these country normal individuals uh, with elevated amyloidosis have been shown um, to be more vulnerable to AD progression. And several reports have claimed that approximately 25% of amyloid positive country normal older individuals converts to mild cognitive impairment or dementia in approximately three years. Thus, uh, with the uh, advancement of amyloid PET, the focus of Alzheimer's disease research has shifted from the clinical and symptomatic stages uh, to the preclinical and asymptomatic stages of AD uh, to better predict the disease progression early. Um, still, the differentiating healthy older individuals from those who are in the preclinical stage of AD uh, remains to be challenging in part because uh, behavioral and neural measures that are sensitive and specific to detect the presence of a beta plus in the stage of preclinical pre autism disease are largely lacking. Um, now, uh, new plasma biomarkers have been developed um, to make it more affordable and more accessible to detect preclinical autism disease. Uh, however, the role of AD pathologies in the pathophysiological process uh, um, of the uh, disease and their influence on cognitive and behavioral changes still remains to be determined. Um, so in a series of studies, we examined whether higher A beta deposition associated uh, with worse cognitive uh, performance among cognitively normal older adults uh, to assess the behavioral consequences of amyloid uh, plaques, uh, beta amyloid plaques in, uh, among cognitive normal older individuals. Um, so um, uh, in this study, we uh, examined the influence of amyloid beta uh, deposition in, uh, on cognition independent of an age effect. Uh, for cognitive measures, we applied a principal component analysis on multiple neuropsychological tests, uh, scores, and identified five cognitive domains, which were verbal episodic memory, uh, visual episodic memory, exact functions, semantic memory, and working memory. Um, then we used the discriminant analysis method uh, to average scores across five cognitive domains, which uh, represent the, the uh, global cognition. Across five cognitive domains, uh, we found a significant age effect in visual episodic memory and executive functions, um, but uh, no amyloid uh, related differences. Uh, however, uh, there was a clear trend that amyloid positive older individuals performed worse uh, than amyloid negative older individuals across the cognitive domains. On the global cognition measure, uh, summarizing five cognitive domain scores, we found a significant difference between amyloid positive and amyloid negative groups, uh, in addition to age related differences. So these results. Uh, uh, when it was published, it was one of the first studies that showed um, amyloid-related, uh, better amyloid-related differences in cognition among currently normal older individuals. Uh, however, uh, it was also possible that the results uh, may have um, reflected uh, sampling bias 
uh, by including very highly, uh, relatively highly educated older individuals in um, the Bay Area in Northern California. So we conducted a meta-analysis uh, where we included uh, multiple amyloid markers, including CSF uh, plasma histopathology, um, PIB PET, as well as other amyloid PET tracers. And across several cognitive domains, we found a significantly worse performance with amyloid deposition in episodic memory, executive function, and global cognition measures. So using effect sizes, mean of effect size of episodic memory was significantly greater uh, than zero. Uh, so were those of executive function and global uh, cognition measures. And furthermore, effect size of episodic memory was significantly greater uh, than other cognitive domains. Um, therefore, even uh, within a range of normal cognition, uh, amyloid deposition uh, relates to worse episodic memory and executive function. And subsequently, more meta-analysis on the same topic, but with larger number of papers were conducted by others. And these uh, subsequently conducted meta-analysis found that uh, amyloid beta deposition is associated uh, with uh, moderate but uh, non-specific levels of cognitive impairment in country normal older individuals uh, with a pattern of neuropsychological uh, impairment uh, across measures of episodic memory, executive function, processing speed, and visual spatial function. Uh, when the clinically intact older individuals were further grouped into amyloid tau neurodegeneration ATN positive and ATN negative groups, ATN positive groups showed more severe impairment across multiple cognitive domains, including a con a global cognitive function and memory. However, uh, it is uh, important to know that effect size of a better, uh, a better related impairment in episodic memory was very small, which was about uh, 0.12. Thus, in order to detect the small effect, a very large number of study participants is needed. And, uh, as autism disease research uh, moves to intervene in pre-symptomatic phases of the disease, there is an increasing need of clinical outcome measures that uh, reflect treatment effect uh, that can be shown before the onset of symptoms. Uh, thus, some uh, measures have been specifically designed to be sensitive enough to detect subtle uh, cognitive changes among clinically integral individuals. Um, the ADCS PAC is designed to serve um, as the primary outcome measure for the uh, uh, trial anti-amyloid treatment in asymptomatic Alzheimer's study. It's known as the A4 study, uh, placebo controlled the secondary prevention trial. Um, the ADCS uh, PAC includes four neuropsychological tests uh, to capture episodic memory, executive function, and orientation. And um, in ADNI uh, data set, uh, using these uh, uh, um, ADCS PAC measures, a better positive older uh, adults, uh, participants indicated uh, here by red triangles, uh, showed more decline than uh, did a better negative older individuals. Um, and it's, uh, which are uh, shown in blue circle uh, with regard to ADCS PAC score, especially at uh, the month of 24, and with expected treatment effect, which is shown in green square. In ABLE study, the mean difference uh, was also significant at uh, uh, both 18 months and 36 months. When longitudinal changes were compared um, between amyloid positive and very high amyloid positive individuals, the level of A beta deposition at baseline was associated with a greater rate of subsequent decline. So collectively, based on this um, behavioral uh, data. Uh, these studies show that contrary to previous understanding, beta amyloid deposition in the preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease relates to worse kind of performance. However, the effect size is small and it requires a large number of study participants to detect this small effect. Um, in another study, we were wondering what is the then neural substrates underlying this subtle kind of differences as a, um, with uh, shown in uh, individuals who has a higher level of amyloid accumulation. Uh, the question we specifically asked is uh, whether higher A beta deposition uh, is associated with worse uh, structural measures among country normal older adults. 
So in this study, we found that there was a gray matter reduction with aging, uh, even when the level of amyloid pathology uh, was accounted for uh, among older adults. Uh, however, among amyloid positive group, we found that there was a significant gray matter reduction with a higher amyloid index in brain regions including uh, right frontal cortex, lateral parietal cortex, anterior cingular, and retrospinal cortex, uh, indicating that there is a noticeable gray matter atrophy in multiple brain regions in association with amyloid deposition. However, I'd like to uh, point that the linkage between cognitive performance and gray matter structure uh, may be uh, uh, lacking regional specificity, especially in um, this um, preclinical uh, st stage of the disease. Um, in this study, we used the factor analysis uh, and um, computed factor based uh, score, factor analysis based cognitive domain scores. And we examined the pattern of cortical uh, thickness in association with the scores uh, from each cognitive domain. And each set of uh, brain maps uh, shown in here uh, for um, showing the brain regions that are positively associated with the scores from each cognitive domain, uh, which is fits of processing, fluid reasoning, vocabulary, and episodic memory. Uh, although, uh, as you can see, there are distinctive patterns of um, um, the gray, uh, gray matter. Uh, that is associated with cognitive performance, there is also substantial overlap uh, across different cognitive domains. Thus, a relating subtle cognitive impairment to gray matter atrophy uh, in preclinical stage of the disease may not be as straightforward and, uh, as we hoped. So while structural MRI data uh, may reflect neuronal injury or loss of dendritic algorization and may be more sensitive once it becomes a, a uh, substantial change occurs. Uh, functional changes may occur without substantial uh, structural changes in the presence of uh, A-beta pathology, as shown in animal models um, in the form of neuronal hyperactivation. So uh, in a series of studies, we examined whether higher A-beta deposition is associated with worse or abnormal neural functions among currently normal older adults. Uh, first, we actually examined this question using FDG PET uh, to examine the relationship between beta amyloid plaques and brain glucose metabolic rates among country normal older adults. Uh, with amyloid PET, we found a relative increase of beta amyloid deposition in medial and lateral uh, parietal and frontal courses. Uh, with FDG PET, we found a relative increase of glucose metabolic rates uh, that reflects synaptic activities in the brain regions that highly overlap with uh, the ones with greater bare amyloid accumulation. And this finding was quite in contrast with what the field uh, believed until then that uh, bare amyloid deposition relates to hypometabolism, not hypermetabolism. Uh, however, Benzinger and colleagues have also found uh, reported hypermetabolism in selective brain regions. Uh, approximately 25 uh, to 20 years before the estimated years of onset uh, to onset in individuals with autosomal dominant autosomal disease. Uh, thus, even in preclinical autosomal disease, neuronal uh, no, uh, activity, uh, changes in neuronal activity occur in the form of hypermetabolism. Uh, uh, in comparison to baseline hyperactivity that uh, could be measured by FTG PET, Assessing brain function during task performance would give us a better insight into functional changes that are tightly coupled with a specific kind of function and would occur due to AED pathologies. Uh, using fMRI scan in this study, we examined the effect of amyloid deposition on brain activation and functional connectivity patterns in association with amyloid pathology. Uh, in this study, subjects viewed the visual scene images uh, presented uh, one by one on the screen and uh, during uh, inside of the scanner and made responses to indicate whether uh, there is water or no water on those each image. And after the scanning session is over, uh, subjects were given a surprise recognition task uh, where they had to indicate whether they are, uh, have seen the image during scanning or not and how confident their responses were. Uh, based on behavioral performance, uh, 
on during that recognition task uh, outside of the scanner, the fMRI images collected uh, during the uh, viewing the images were sorted for high confidence hit and uh, missed trials. And the contrast between two of those conditions were used to examine uh, age and a beta related differences in uh, brain activation for successful memory encoding. Um, in the young subjects, when brain activation uh, was uh, for successful uh, memory encoding was examined, uh, there was an increased brain activity in frontal parietal cortex and visual association areas in hippocampus, which forms a core network of episodic memory encoding. And this task of positive activation pattern was reduced in older uh, adults without amyloid uh, plaques. Better amyloid plaques, but um, better amyloid, po amyloid positive older adults showed overall enhanced activation throughout the brain. Um, this uh, age and A beta related differences in brain activation was became more obvious when we compared activation between uh, subject groups, and compared to older adults, young subjects showed increased uh, activation in warm colored regions, which are highlighted. Uh, um, highly implicated in episodic memory encoding. And uh, when we compared amyloid positive and amyloid negative older individuals, uh, amyloid positive individuals showed a significantly increased activation across the brain, uh, including hippocampus and uh, right frontal cortex. When uh, we also examined uh, the degree of functional connectivity differences uh, during this memory uh, performance, um, uh, as a function of amyloid accumulation, uh, particularly in the functional network that connects to the right perihippocampal uh, gyrus, which has been uh, highly implicated in syn processing, um, so in, in uh, uh, relation to other brain regions. And we found that there was a, a significant increase in functional connectivity between this right perihippocampal gyrus and other brain regions, uh, lateral uh, temporal occipital cortex and the right uh, frontal cortex. Um, in uh, amyloid negative older individuals than amyloid positive individuals. So um, this uh, regional brain activation as well as functional connectivity results uh, collectively indicate that with amyloid accumulation, uh, regional brain activity during task uh, increases, but functional connectivity across the core brain regions supporting episodic uh, memory encoding decreases. Uh, we, uh, in another study, we further uh, wanted to understand what this increased activation in association with amyloid accumulation um, does uh, in relation to behavior. Uh, what's the uh, role of that increased uh, hyper neural activity uh, in association with amyloid accumulation in preclinical Alzheimer's disease? So in this uh, task paradigm, um, the level of visual details um, that subject had to recall uh, was varied. So during the scanning session, um, subjects just view the visual images um, and indicate whether there is people or no people, which is very similar with the previous uh, task paradigm. Um, but during the test phase, we assess the memory uh, retrieval in different forms. Uh, in one form, the subjects had to assess the gist memory of visual images. Uh, for which the subjects were given a phrase describing the image uh, that uh, phrase describes. Then um, next, the subjects were given six descriptors uh, regarding the visual details about the scenes. So we computed the recognition uh, memory index uh, based on the accuracy on those gist-based questions, as well as a number of visual uh, detailed information that was collect, uh, correctly recalled uh, based on, on their performance on those six dis descriptors. Uh, across the subject groups, young and amyloid negative and amyloid positive groups, there was no behavior differences. Uh, however, in fMRI uh, brain activation patterns, we found that as number of detail increases, activation level increased more in amyloid positive older subjects than amyloid negative older subjects. So this pattern of activation um, uh, also uh, this increased activation also inc uh, correlated with the number of correctly recalled visual information in amyloid positive older individuals. So the results indicating that amyloid related hyperactivity actually has a functional significance uh, by helping count the performance and track the uh, memory strength. Uh, but uh, we, uh, uh, in this, uh, some other analysis, we found that those uh, increased activation will eventually undergo the functional impairment. 
uh, I'd like to highlight uh, that it is uh, important to know that topographic distribution of amyloid deposition is not universal, but rather selective in the brain. Um, amyloid PET uh, shows higher uh, a beta accumulation are mostly seen in lateral and medial frontal parietal cortices, while relatively devoid in the medial temporal lobes. And this is consistent with the neuropathological data showing that initial amyloid depo uh, deposits uh, develop in the neocortex and spread into um, adjoining areas and the hippocampus and uh, last the primary sensory and motor cortices. So uh, it's still uh, uh, important to understand what this amyloid uh, pathology does uh, in brain regions um, by looking into the relationship and their functions on other uh, brain regions outside of the medial temporal lobe uh, that has been uh, targeted by episodic memory paradigms. So in order to examine a better related functional alterations in the frontal parietal regions, uh, to, uh, we use the working memory uh, task paradigm, um, uh, let, uh, letter stumper task, and image healthy young and country normal older individuals uh, using functional MRI. Um, during the task. And we also use the flow better than PET to um, determine the amyloid positivity uh, status of older adults. Um, within um, brain regions commonly recruited by all subject groups during the delay period, which is the core component of working memory, uh, age and a beta deposition was independently associated uh, with load dependent uh, hyperactivation in front of prior cortex. Uh, Although there was additional a beta related hyperactivity found uh, beside, uh, uh, beyond the frontal parietal uh, regions. Uh, these results suggest that a beta related hyperactivation is not specific to the episodic memory system, um, such as medial temporal lobes, but occurs in the frontal parietal courses uh, and regions as well. Um, to further the test, the uh, hypothesis. Um, in the association between the, uh, the impact of a beta deposition on uh, frontal parietal cortices, uh, we, uh, in another study, we used the task switching paradigm um, during the subject, uh, during fMRI scan, and where subjects did uh, the task uh, either as a single task or a dual task. So in a single task block, subjects did a vowel consonant judgment or a lower or uppercase judgment, depending on the color of letters. And um, for the dual task condition, um, color of letters changed throughout the block. Uh, therefore, subjects have to change the task uh, they are performing depending on the color of the uh, letters. Then we contrast the activation differences between dual task condition and single task condition and look at how this activation pattern differ as a function of amyloid positivity. Uh, in the behavior performance, young subjects tend to uh, respond faster, but the accuracy um, uh, level was equivalent across uh, subject groups. When we compare the brain activation pattern between amyloid positive and amyloid negative groups, we found uh, the increased activation in right uh, inferior frontal cortex and anterior uh, insular regions in amyloid uh, uh, negative older individuals than amyloid positive older individuals. And this pattern was more obvious in this uh, bar charts, uh, but in order to uh, better understand what is going on in each task conditions, uh, we plotted the data by task conditions. And uh, we found that in amyloid positive older individuals, actually the brain activation was uh, higher than amyloid negative older individuals for um, easier task, which was a single task condition. But uh, when the task became more difficult, amyloid positive older individuals uh, failed to increase activation, uh, whereas amyloid negative older individuals could ramp up more uh, to meet the demands of the task. So these results uh, show that with amyloid deposition, task-related activation increases in easier task condition, um, but fail to uh, increase as the task becomes more <clears throat> currently demanding. Um, however, we all know that in, during the preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease, uh, tau uh, neurofibrillary tangles are also present in a varying degree. So uh, in, um, in, with tau and neurofibrillary uh, pathologies, in contrast to amyloid deposits, the topographic distribution of tau pathology starts 
uh, with the accumulation in the middle temporal lobe and spread to association choruses. Uh, Taupe scans also replicate this topographic distribution observed in postmodern data. So uh, for the, uh, in order to move forward with uh, linking the amyloid pathologies to specific kinds of functions and neural systems, uh, it is important uh, to apply the task that is more specifically related to uh, the medial temporal lobe functions to capture uh, the uh, effect of top pathology. And the task paradigms listed on this slide uh, are the uh, good candidate tasks uh, that recently developed and uh, can be tested to assess the function of middle temporal lobe and the impact of top pathology in those regions. Um, it's still uh, uh, translating these uh, tasks back to the clinic, uh, however, is quite limited uh, currently, but uh, neuropsychology has already begun to uh, capitalize some of the findings from these kinds of paradigms uh, to better specify memory process um, and um, underlying neural networks to enhance diagnosis, prognosis, and validation of therapeutic strategies. Uh, these tasks have advantages over uh, also assessments, such as instrumental activities of daily living, and that are often cognitively more complex than basic cognitive processes. And uh, failure of those activities uh, sometimes does not indicate the stage at which the breakdown occurs. Uh, some clinical uh, trials are ongoing to, uh, to test the uh, reducing um, the effect of reducing hippocampal hyperactivity uh, as a disease modifying treatment uh, using levetiracetam um, anti epileptic drugs. So, this is another avenue that uh, the kind of neuroscience approach can be utilized to test the treatment effect. Last, I'd like to highlight some of the findings uh, that show how the individual differences, such as lifestyle uh, activities, impact on the AD pathologies and um, neural system um, in the preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease. So lifestyle, such as uh, education and diet, have been uh, considered as reserve uh, that moderate the relationship between pathology and clinical symptoms. But uh, there seems to be also a direct relationship between the two. So in this study, we assessed the kind of activities across different time points uh, throughout one's life and related the level of lifetime kind of activity to amyloid deposition. We found that with higher lifetime kind of activity, there was a, a lower amyloid deposition. And uh, this relationship between higher lifetime activity and lower amyloid accumulation uh, was also seen in the voxel-wise analysis on amyloid PET data, where dark blue regions indicate the uh, higher amyloid accumulation uh, in the regions uh, uh, relating to the lower kind of activity. And also the uh, individual differences uh, reflected in education also can impact on brain activation patterns. So uh, in the um, uh, uh, executive um, con uh, control task that I uh, previously described, we examined how the brain activation patterns actually are affected by um, the uh, lifetime activity that uh, was uh, quantified using the education in um, uh, the IQ levels. And we found among amyloid negative older individuals, uh, with a higher lifetime activity, uh, there was a less brain activation. However, among amyloid positive older adults, there was an increased activation as the um, lifetime activity uh, index was uh, higher. So uh, it is important to account for the individual differences uh, that uh, reflect lifestyle patterns in the uh, assessing the neural activation as well. Uh, recently, we also examined non-cognitive aspects uh, as individual differences in relation to amyloid deposition among country normal older adults. Uh, in particular, we are interested in looking at the impact of personality uh, traits on uh, amyloid deposition um, based on fMRI studies that found uh, differential brain activation level in association with extroversion and neuroticism. So in this study, we hypothesized that with higher extroversion, 
there will be less amyloid accumulation, but with higher neurology system, there will be more amyloid accumulation. Uh, where uh, in this study, we did not find any significant relationship between neurology system and amyloid among country normal older adults. Uh, however, we found that higher extroversion was associated with lower amyloid accumulation uh, in these cyan colored uh, areas where amyloid um, plus typically accumulate. So uh, I've shown so far about the, how the quantum neuroscience approaches can uh, show us the differences uh, as a function of amyloid pathology uh, in um, um, neural uh, aspects, but uh, there is a still a lot of work that needs to be done to uh, translate this kind of neuroscience approach to uh, uh, clinical practice. So one uh, obvious uh, issues is that the current task paradigms are relatively long to be implemented in clinical setting. So it's important to develop and devise a task uh, that is robust and efficiently uh, efficient and uh, can be uh, done in a short period of time. And another uh, issue uh, with the quantum neuroscience approach is to uh, the standard is related to the standardization and quantification uh, of the measures and uh, uh, the way that it's, it is administered. Uh, however, there is also uh, large scale studies uh, in, uh, in ABCD studies as well as human connectome studies that uses quantum neuroscience uh, based task in multiple sites. So it is. Uh, achievable, but there are a lot of work that needs to be done at this point. And also it is important to uh, mention that uh, high test retest reliability uh, on cognitive measures as well as neural measures uh, utilizing uh, novel cognitive neuroscience approaches um, needs to be established for each person. And also it is important to model trial by trial uh, based uh, neural measures uh, in relation to kind of performance uh, and AD pathologies uh, using computational neuroscience approaches. And also uh, as in other fields, um, the country neuroscience studies uh, and task paradigms needs to be tested in more diverse populations. So to conclude, uh, I've shown that country neuroscience approaches show cognitively normal older adults in preclinical autism disease present uh, higher brain activity and um, cognitive, um, across cognitive, uh, multiple cognitive tasks and compared to older adults without uh, better amyloid deposition. Also, I've shown individual differences such as uh, lifetime cognitive activities, education and personality traits affect the level of autism disease pathologies and task related neural activity in preclinical autism disease. Um, I would uh, also mention that more standardization in quantifying uh, measures and administration is needed for applications of quantum neuroscience approaches uh, to atom disease research and treatment. Uh, last, I'd like to uh, thank my uh, wonderful lab members and uh, colleagues and collaborators in the memory and aging program at Butler Hospital and um, continued support of psychiatry, Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior. Uh, and my collaborators in the Department of Country Linguistic and Psychological Sciences at Brown University and former collaborators at Columbia University uh, and last um, William Jacobs Laboratory at uh, UC Berkeley for continued collaboration. And uh, we, we, our lab has the postdoctoral researcher and research assistant positions available. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in preclinical autism disease research using uh, Partial emission tomography and functional MRI, feel free to contact me. And thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for such a great presentation. Um, to remind everyone, please add your questions to the Q&A or to the chat if you have any uh, comments. Um, I guess I can start. I actually have, I have two questions. The first one, being it's, I think it's really interesting that you found that association between amyloid and extroversion. And I was wondering if you could say more about why you think there is a relationship. Okay, so uh, if the hypothesis was based on actually fMRI uh, studies uh, that show that uh, with uh, extroversion, um, um, 
personality traits. And from my studies, consistently have shown the lower activation during the task uh, with higher extroversion scores. Whereas uh, with uh, neuronal, higher neuroticism scores, uh, individuals tend to show increased activation in part of the default mode network. Uh, during the FMI study. So inconsistent with uh, um, hyperneural activity linking to the accumulation of amyloid uh, deposition, um, we hypothesize that the personality trait uh, of extroversion may relate to uh, lower amyloid accumulation, whereas the higher neuroticism um, trait may relate to uh, higher amyloid accumulation. However, this uh, hypothesis was tested among conscious normal older individuals um, so it um, uh, might be a little bit uh, selective samples that uh, higher neuroticism, um, individuals with higher neuroticism might not be fully captured in this uh, cohort. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline has a question. Uh, have you looked at the role of cardiovascular risk factors in fMRI hyperactivity in older adults with amyloid positivity? And related to that, what about examining the role of white matter connectivity? That's a wonderful question. Um, so I haven't uh, looked into that uh, cerebrovascular factors in relation to brain activation um, and also the white matter changes in relation to brain activation. So that's clearly the next avenue that I would uh, look uh, forward to looking into. Um, in terms of um, um, the, uh, it is very interesting that in quantum neuroscience field in a uh, normal aging, actually there was not much studies that look into the sort of vascular components in relation to functional fMRI activation data using functional MRI, even though there was a, a large structural uh, MRI-based studies looking into the uh, white matter hyperintensity volumes in white matter tracts, uh, as well as the uh, DTI measures. But uh, not much work has been done in relation to um, brain activation measured by functional MRI. Thanks. Um, any, if anyone has the questions, please, again, feel free to add them to the Q&A. Um, I had another question too. So you show that individuals who had engaged in more intellectual activities, I think you mentioned lifetime activities, um, had a greater activity in certain brain regions. I can't remember exactly, but I think they seem to be more like lateral frontal regions. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, a lot also on people who have higher amyloid levels and seem to be at greater risk for dementia, you also see this increase in activity in different brain regions, both in resting state and test-related um, fMRI um, that they may be indicative of their, right, there's something uh, going on that's not healthy. And so I'm curious about whether you think there are certain patterns that show that having increased activity is actually a good thing um, versus it may actually be a sign of that something bad is coming and like dementia or mm -hmm. yeah what are your thoughts about that yeah um so yes uh, that is actually a great question and i also uh, there are a lot of actually components even though we observe something sometimes it's quite difficult to interpret what is actually going on so i have to admit that uh, increased activity uh, in relation to whether the in, uh, lifetime uh, activity or education will relate to increased brain activation versus uh, reduced brain activation. But for somehow I observed the lower activation with higher uh, uh, intellectual activity as a function of the status. So, um, but um, based on the animal models, the increased neural hyperactivity uh, relates to List some a vicious cycle of amyloid accumulation. So, uh, sort of, uh, uh, since there is a biological mechanism that uh, leads to the vicious cycle, uh, in terms of the uh, human brain activations, um, it is a little bit less clear how to interpret it. Uh, but uh, there is also uh, the uh, uh, the uh, group of people who thinks that more efficient. 
uh, neuronal activation, which may be captured either by uh, better functional connectivity or a lower level of regional brain activation might be better, uh, especially in the older population. So along with that uh, perspective, um, I think the uh, findings that I reported is fit with uh, uh, lower activation, maybe consider more efficient brain uh, resources um, uh, within uh, individuals with a higher education level or intellectual activity. And, um, but with the amyloid uh, deposition, it seems the increased activity also have some um, types of the uh, functional role that helping them to keep their kind of performance normal. So in that sense, the increased activity in the presence of amyloid pathology might be better. And that's why the, um, the cognitive reserve on higher education may sort of delay the cognitive decline. Um, but eventually it may also the part of the vicious cycle of the amyloid accumulation. Yes, thank you for your answer. I always struggle when I um, see those results trying to um, mm -hmm. figure them out. Any, anyone has any other questions? Um, I ha we have one question here. You mentioned several cognitive tasks that are sensitive to early memory and pathology. Do you have a hypothesis on which cognitive tasks might translate best to a clinical setting? Um, so I think it's, uh, thank you for the great question. Uh, that's uh, kind of the goal of my research program to achieve, uh, to identify the better cognitive tasks at this point. Uh, we are doing a lot of experiments to identify those tasks, um, but the idea is that at this point, um, it's a bit unclear what might be the best task to be used, but certainly there are the tasks that has been uh, available and quite shown very sensitive to the top pathology, such as the uh, uh, pattern separation task using objects. So there are some tasks, uh, but um, I think it's also very important to show the specificity of the effect of the task uh, by including a bit more controlled task. So uh, it would be important to see the effect only in the one task that uh, links to the top pathology or amyloid pathology while not showing, uh, seeing the effect in the control task. If the control task is actually targeting um, the brain regions that doesn't have much accumulation of amyloid or top pathology. For example, very simple visual task uh, in the targeting the visual cortex uh, might be a good uh, candidate as a control task. Uh, and it would be important to have that in conjunction with memory task to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to show a uh, tau uh, specific effect in those tasks. And we have another question here. Can you talk more about how to use to adapt these tasks in diverse populations? Um, okay, um, so which task? Um, oh, okay, okay. thank you. I'm, I'm guessing oh. um, the, a lot of the fMRI tasks that you mentioned, mm -hmm. probably. Yeah, so uh, currently, I uh, the, in terms of the task that I showed, I showed the task that I uh, used the visual images, the scene images, whether there's a people or no people or water or no water, landscape images. Also, I showed the task that actually used the letters, alphabetical letters. Um, so, but uh, in terms of the apl applying this method in the diverse population, I think that currently the language is a big barrier. Uh, and also a language is also related to the cognitive reserve and education levels. So in order to minimize the impact of education levels and uh, language barrier, uh, I, uh, in my program, we currently using more visual based tasks so that uh, it, it can be less uh, affected by the cultural backgrounds. All right. Um... It seems like we are almost out of time, but thank you so much again for your presentation. It was really great to hear about everything that you've done and the important work that you are doing now.
And thank you everyone for joining us today. And please remember to uh, that we will have another speaker uh, next month. It's always the last Friday of every month at noon. So yeah, I hope you all have a great weekend and please stay warm and, and safe. Thanks. Bye, Bye everyone.